Thanks for the introduction. Um, this is going to be a bit statistics heavy. Maybe I should have showed this one, f this slide first, so how, just to uh, give an idea of how complicated the real world A-B testing can be. Uh, you know, the real world is messy, as I was mentioning. Um, one, you know, this is, this is just an example of, you know, how a real world A-B testing platform uh, might work. And uh, so, so what we have done uh, at Uber is we have uh, basically created a A-B testing platform. So it's a scalable platform, experiments happening, I don't know, thousand experiments every day globally. We don't even keep track. Um, we are responsible on the platform side of it, which means we actually build all these components that I mentioned here. Um, but uh, the idea of creating a scalable platform is, um, you know, we want people uh, who are not data scientists uh, to be able to conduct the experiment. So these are people, like let's say city operations people or folks who are, you know, talking to uh, drivers and all that. They form a hypothesis. They have domain knowledge, tribal knowledge. So they are perfectly capable of conducting an experiment as long as we don't ask them to, you know, uh, write a Python notebook or something like that. So this is, we created a sort of an app version of A-B testing, which where we, you know, um, every whatever happens behind the curtain, the users don't necessarily need to know. Uh, they can just form a hypothesis and, uh, you know, just everything happens automatically. So each one of these boxes, uh, more or less, these are all automated decisions. So users are actually not making decision. Uh, the algorithm is. So for example, so first the input data comes in, and uh, we look at outliers, and I will get into the details later on, but outliers are basically, uh, again, gets, if I could go back to the example of uh, you know, a CTR predictions, let's say you, e-commerce company, you introduced a buy one, get one offer, and uh, you see a huge you know, lift in the CTR. So you, you get all overjoyed and all that, but it could be that only five people are you know, heavy buyer in that. Uh, click through rate, sorry. Um, and that's, that's just an example I'm saying. Um, so only five, only five people out of 100 people are you know, uh, buying a lot of stuff. Now, is that a good thing for the future? Well, uh, maybe, maybe not, right? So that's uh, something that business has to decide. Like if you, if you have introduced a feature that only 5% of your users only care about, uh, then A, maybe you have to change how you want to experiment. So maybe not all users, maybe those users have a profile, or your future feature is just not very good. I mean, if it in only 5% um, of people care about, you're not going to make money out of it. Yeah. Uh, just want, just trying to understand what do you mean by user users as an user of this platform or right uh, yeah we can we we have some control we uh, I, we have less control than a typical e-commerce company so in e-commerce you can really control like who goes to what bucket we I mean imagine you as a user of a ride hailing service right you get to a Uber pool I get to a Uber pool you are part of a treatment I'm control there is no like I'm not like the algorithm cannot control which car, like ideally you should go to one car, I go to another car, but there's no way to control. So, and that's where this uh, network effect or uh, collisionality that I was mentioning, all this complication arise. Like how can I control, uh, you know, my, uh, I guess my satisfaction against yours. Let's say, you know, let's, let's say a concrete thing, right? So let's say that we introduce something in the ETA algorithm that if there is an event happening in San Francisco, maybe we'll take another route, for example, right? And I'm not going to that event. You are, right? And uh, let's say you are, you will be dropped off before me. So you will be very happy because you will, you are getting there faster. But maybe because you are getting there faster, I'm going there slower to another destination, right? So how is my, you know? So it's a network effect, right? And it's very difficult to control. So those are all the you know the messy details that gets into that I cannot cover in 90 minutes. But uh, but yeah, I mean you know uh, getting back to this diagram. So I think like if I look at if you look at this diagram, it probably covers 90% of the business cases 
in real world scenario. So we look for outliers. We also look for uh, you know the sample imbalances between control and treatment. And uh, then we check for the metric type. And this is where things are getting a bit technical. Um, so depending on you know if you have a stat background versus not, it may or may not helpful now. But you can always Google it later on. Um, and then depending on what metric type, we choose what test to do. And uh, the point that I'm trying to drive here is all of this entire thing that we have built, uh, users, user as in the plat user of this platform, they're, um, they, they, uh, they just you know, input the data and everything else happens automatically. So they don't have to decide what sample size is or um, you know, what kind of test they want to do and all that. So it's all automated. Yes. Yes. So statistical power is the type two error. So that's the typically we set it to eighty percent. So the no, that's a good question. So the value proposition uh, is not part of this platform, but it is a separate platform that talks to this. So this is a stat engine. That's one way to think about it. But the business platform, I mean, the the business proposition uh, would be you know like making these decisions like. You know, who should who should I approach, right? So in that outlier case, uh, you know, if there is only five percent clicking, maybe I should find out who those profiles profiles of those users are, and create a separate experiment just for those users to gain maximum out of it. So those types of um, it's it's called experiment configuration, and that's a separate platform that where this configuration happens. It's not really a data science platform. It's more like a Business um, decision being engineered. Like exactly. So it's a it's a it's an engineering problem. Yeah. Uh, we uh, that's a good question. So we do have plans to uh, make some part of it open source um, because I I think there in the community there is a gap of you know plug and play platform. Um, so there's an opportunity, you know, like not making money but uh, yeah, just. So giving back to the community. So now these are the real fun parts, uh, you know, stat stuff. Um, so at the heart of any hypothesis testing is this uh, very celebrated statistics theorem called central limit theorem. Um, I don't know how many of you are aspiring data scientists. There is a 60% chance that in the phone interview you will be asked what this theorem is. <laughs> right, so, so basically, uh, you know, if I remove this all math jargon, all it is saying is, um, regardless of what type of distribution your users or the um, your yeah, underlying users have, as long as you have sufficiently large number of users and they're kind of independent of each other, uh, it actually goes it, it it forms a Gaussian distribution. So you know, it's a normal distribution with the peak and a tail on both sides. And the A-B testing is motivated by, you know, basically this, this equation where I was showing that, that lift. So lift is mathematically this. Whatever you are measuring in the treatment group minus whatever you are measuring in the control group. And then you divide that by the spread in your control and the treatment group because not all users are born alike. So there will be some variations to you know, what the users look like. So that is encoded here. That's the variance. And n are basically the sample size which we calculate before we conduct the experiment. So once you plug all of this component there, 80% of the hypothesis testing is basically solving that equation. And the other 20%, you know, we care about all these um, network effect and collisionality and all that. And then uh, the power calculation, I guess someone mentioned, uh, so that's the type two error. So um, so by default, we set type one error to roughly 5%. It's one of those tribal knowledge that I guess evolved from, you know, the early tech companies like Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera, and then everyone follows it. But there is no reason to set it to 5%. It, you know, varies from business problem to business problem. You can set it to 1%, 10%. Uh, 
um, and then you you know we we denote the you know this um, the mean of the treatment group and the control. So you know it's basically the average of whatever we are measuring in the treatment and control. And uh, MDE is the minimum detectable effect. And what that means is the business is saying, I will be delighted to see a 20% lift, but I am OK if I see 10%. You know, I'm still going to rule out that feature. So that's the minimum detectable effect. And why it is important? Um, because uh, we use this, before the start of the experiment, we use this to find out the, what the sample size that we need to absolutely make sure that you know we reach that MDE. You have a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. One question on the type one error, the number. What's the consequences of like checking it low versus high? Right. Is there more data to test, or is it like my experiment has a great data chance of passing or failing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. So so yeah. So if I if I set, uh, so these are think of all of these as a lever arm in your experiment. So if I set alpha, if I increase alpha, so 10%, then I need less sample size to get the same lift. Okay. Now if I say, okay, you know, my minimum detectable effect has to be more than whatever I decided earlier. So that in turn will require more sample size. But then I might say, well, you know, I'm asking for more in the minimum detectable effect, but I'm probably okay with, you know, I have more money, so I'm okay just bleeding money if that's the case. So my, I set my type one error to you know slightly higher, so that can bring down the sample size. So really, it's a, it's it's more like a lever arm, uh, you know. It's, a, it's it's an interplay between what lift you want, what error you are okay with, that determines the sample size. Duration uh, duration is actually relatively easy to figure out, I would say, for a mature company. Because uh, you know you roughly know how many users are coming through your funnel based on the previous history, and so once you have figured out the sample size, let's say you know for this experiment you need one million people, right? So you know how many, how much time it will take for that one million people to come. Now, one important point I would like to make is um, let's say you get one million people like. At Uber, whatever we do, if it's one million people, we'll, we'll get that maybe in five minutes. But is that a good experiment? If I just start and stop the experiment in five minutes? Probably the answer is no. Because um, users behave differently in different times of the week. Uh, I probably care more about ETA on Monday at 9 AM versus Sunday at 6 PM. That's one example. So. Would regardless of the sample size, this is again one of those like tribal knowledge that I passed from Amazon, Google, I mean Amazon, Microsoft, and to rest of the companies. We we want to run the experiment at least for two weeks. There is the two weeks rule, you know, that people typically try to follow. If not, at least one week to get that entire you know week, you know, that that pattern. Of course, uh, it cannot be done continuously, like you have to set another experiment. But yes, it is possible that I ran one experiment and uh, I saw something and that led to another hypothesis and you run another experiment for that. I would say, you know, it's, uh, it's more or less determined by, uh, you know, whether, whether holiday, actually holidays or all these events that tends to have a spike, like Thanksgiving we have a spike. So those actually fall into the category of outliers. So let's say I ran an experiment and uh, it ended in 2017, November 24th, right? So that's the Thanksgiving two days holiday out of the 14 days I ran. So I'm going to see a spike. Does that mean it's a good feature? Probably not, unless that feature is especially f just for Thanksgiving, which probably is not the case, right? So in that, that case, uh, you know, uh, the outlier becomes important. And I think I have a slide for that. Uh, so this is where you know we want to remove those outliers. Uh, so if we have these spikes, which is not a representation of the true uh, flow, we want to remove them and then do the analysis. Oh no! So for ETA in this case, we measure the exact ETA. I mean internally we know Actually, what the ETA is. Yeah, yeah. So That's analysis. absolutely yeah. Uh, I would say ETA is definitely going to impact my happiness. 
you know, if it gets longer, I'm unhappy. Uh, but that's a ramification of this. So the hypothesis in this case, I would say, is has ETA increased? If yes, how much? And then, you know, historically, we know, like, if the ETA increased, what the unhappiness looks like, you know. Yes, and do we, we do impact traffic, we know that. Um, so you do, it's like a, you know, the most optimal route gets so, uh, this, uh, right, right. I mean, you know, it's, it's, so the ETA prediction by itself is like a beast by itself, you know, like there's a whole, you know, department <laughs> dedicated to that. Um, but yeah, the short answer is yes. Okay. 